Our second speaker is Luke Lavis. Luke received his bachelor's in chemistry at Oregon State doing synthetic organic chemistry with James White. He then spent four years in the biotech industry, first at molecular probes in Eugene, Oregon, and later at molecular devices in Sunnyvale, California. Luke received his PhD in organic chemistry with Ronald Raines at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he designed and built novel fluorescent dyes to image molecular trafficking in living cells. Just out of grad school, Luke accepted a postdoc, uh, Luke accepted a group leader position at Chenelia in 2008 and became a senior group leader and head of molecular tools and imaging in 2017. Luke's lab works at the interface of chemistry and biology, developing labels for single molecule imaging, strategies for targeted molecular delivery, and probes to measure cellular activity in intact brain tissue. His lab has developed a set of Janelia fluor dyes, which are being used in labs around the world, and which he will tell us more about in his talk today. Okay, so let me start again. So um, I'll define uh, tool building this way, creating instruments, uh, techniques, reagents, and data sets, and computational approaches to push the frontiers of biological research. And as I mentioned, uh, you know, we have this uh, core research area, Janelia, uh, molecular tools and imaging. And so we have optical physicists, we have uh, protein engineers and cell and molecular biologists, and we have chemists. And uh, so this is a group of uh, scientists who don't necessarily focus on biology, but they're at a biological institute. So how does this work? There's a couple key tenants that uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, that we that guide this uh, uh, tool building philosophy at Genelia. First of all, uh, independence. We're all independent experts in our own fields. We formulate and test hypotheses in the areas of science that we work in. But of course, uh, we're always looking for some biological application. Uh, another tenant is collaboration. Uh, we work with other tool builders and biologists uh, to solve problems. And Eric gave a great example with the Voltron story that involved uh, several different labs ranging from chemistry, protein engineering, microscopy, and systems neuroscience in flies, fish, and mice. Uh, we're patient. We like to say we want to generate industry-level tools, bulletproof tools. And Harold and Eric Bedsick and myself and Abraham all spent time in industry before coming to Genelia. And so we recognize the effort that it takes to transform a prototype tool into something that is truly useful. And then finally, uh, dissemination. Uh, we want to freely share tools with everyone. So uh, this idea of dissemination is really hardwired into the DNA of Genelia, and that's because of our founding director, Jerry Rubin. This is Jerry in his current form. But Jerry has a decades-long uh, commitment to distributing the tools that he's developed over his career to the broader community. So I wanna tell you a, a story about an earlier version of Jerry. Uh, this is Jerry in graduate school. This is actually too early. I just wanted to show this picture because I think it's cool. Uh, but the story I wanna tell you about is sort of 80s, 90s Jerry. And this was the best picture I could find on the internet. Sorry, Jerry. Uh, but <clears throat> Jerry and his collaborator, Ellen Spraldine, figured out a way to introduce trans genes into flies. This was reported in this science paper from 1982. <clears throat> and um, the first public uh, presentation of this work took place in a Drosophila research conference at the University of Connecticut earlier that year. And Jerry and Alan showed up not just with slides detailing their science, but also 300 kits uh, with bacteria and a detailed protocol so other people could uh, use their methods. So one thing Jerry always says is the ultimate test for a tool builder is where others, uh, whether or not others will use our tools. And so this really set the tone. And of course, we're continuing that with uh, Ron Bale, our new director, uh, but Ron's only been here a couple months, so I'm not quite brave enough to search the internet and show old pictures of Ron. All right, so we have all these tool builders developing a variety of different tools. And of course, uh, the uh, different tools require different dissemination strategies. So for genetically encoded tools, protein-based tools, Eric already shared uh, the way that we disseminate this technology. 
uh, we created the Genie project team. They uh, take the prototype tools uh, that are developed in these labs and then using high throughput screening approaches, they uh, uh, optimize them and uh, test them in different model organisms. And then ultimately, uh, they uh, distribute them through adgene. So they deposit plasmids on adgene and, and then uh, that organization takes care of the dissemination. For microscopes, it's a little bit different. Although we'd love to send a microscope and a expert physicist to run it to every single lab in the world, we simply can't do that. So instead, the idea is to send scientists to microscopes. And so for this, we created the Advanced Imaging Center, or AIC. Uh, this is a collaboration with the Moore Foundation, and it houses uh, instruments developed here at Genelia uh, by uh, folks uh, like these guys, um, and then uh, makes them freely available to the community. And Leong, uh, the director of the AIC, will give a talk in this seminar, seminar series later and tell you about this exciting effort. For small molecule based tools, uh, unlike proteins, we don't necessarily need high throughput screening to optimize them. We can do that in our own lab, uh, but uh, we do need help uh, testing these in cells and animals, and then actually making the material and physically sending it out. There is no ad gene for chemicals, and so it's up to us to distribute these uh, to the broader community. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about some of the small molecule tools uh, that my lab has developed. So I've been working in this field of small molecule fluorescent dyes for 20 years now. And in this chart I made back in graduate school, I show 30 commonly used fluorescent molecules in biology. They're plotted according to their brightness against the absorption maximum of the dye. That's what each one of these points denote. And then the corresponding structures are colored according to the emission maximum of the dye. Now, the point of this slide is not to go through every structure, but it's just to showcase that we have a large uh, number of fluorophores that span the UV, the visible, and the near-infrared. And as chemists, we can take these molecules and tune and tweak them for specific biological applications. And so my lab has focused on these classic fluorophores, fluorescine and the rhodamines. And we like these dyes because they're near the top in terms of brightness and uh, span a good chunk of the visible region of the spectrum. Now, one thing about these dyes is that they're fairly old. Fluorescein was synthesized first in 1871 in the lab of Adolf von Bayer, and the rhodamine dyes pop up in the patent literature 16 years uh, after that, synthesized by the Swiss chemist Marie Sarasol, who was working at BASF. And so the age of these dyes is something of a double-edged sword. On one hand, the fact that we're still using fluorescenes and rhodamines, these classic fluorophores in modern biological experiments, is a real testament to their properties. We've had 100 years to find better fluorophores, and we, we simply haven't. But from an organic chemistry standpoint, the age of these dyes is, is a problem. It means that the methods used to synthesize these molecules are often quite old. And so when I started my lab at Genelia, one idea we had was uh, to bring modern chemistry to bear on some of these old scaffolds. And the general idea was if we came up with new chemistry, then perhaps we could make new versions of these dyes with improved properties, and that could ultimately enable new biological experiments. So here was the original classic chemistry. You would take aminophenols and phthalic anhydrides and literally boil them in sulfuric acid for a day uh, to generate rhodamine dyes. So this severely limited the type of functionality that we could install in these fluorophores to basic methyl groups and other uh, very simple substituents. So instead, we used a modern chemical reaction, in this case, a palladium catalyzed cross-coupling reaction developed by Steve Buckwald at MIT. And using this, we could transform simple fluorescein derivatives into rhodamines. These conditions are much more mild and it allowed us to uh, uh, test uh, uh, different substituents on these rhodamines to see if we could make uh, better dyes. So here's one example uh, where we took this classic fluorophore tetramethylrhodamine containing these dimethyl amino groups 
and transformed it into this dye we call Genelia Floor 549 or JF 549 based on its absorption maximum in water. Uh, and uh, we installed these little four-membered azetidine rings. Uh, this is just a net addition of two carbon atoms. Uh, but what we did is uh, greatly improve the brightness of the fluorophore. So the quantum yield of the fluorophore went up from 41% uh, to 88%. So this new dye enabled new experiments together with my colleagues in molecular tools and imaging, James Liu and Eric Betzik, along with uh, Bob Tijan. Uh, we attached uh, this Genelia Floor 549 using the halo tag that Eric mentioned earlier to a transcription factor of SOX2, and then could image the stable binding sites of this transcription factor in live cells. And we found uh, it formed these little uh, so-called enhancer clusters. So uh, this was the beginning of uh, a long journey uh, developing a palette of uh, small molecule fluorescent dyes called the Genelia fluor dyes. So we started with this uh, 560, 550 nanometer excited fluorophore JF549. We found this azetidine trick was general. We could apply it to far red fluorophores like these silicon rhodamines to give JF646. And then uh, we figured out ways to fine tune the spectral and chemical properties of the dyes by using substituted azetidines. And so now we have a whole palette and we recently expanded this palette a little bit further uh, into the near infrared and also a little bit farther into the blue. Now this dye JF525 was, to be honest, just kind of put in here to fill out the spectrum. But uh, Eric mentioned this briefly, this ended up being a fantastic dye uh, for in vivo use with the Voltron system. Uh, it was bioavailable and the spectrum matched the opsin used uh, in, in Voltron. So we have all these dyes in different colors, uh, but more importantly, we have efficient chemistry to make them so we can synthesize them in reasonable quantities. And that raised the possibility, maybe we could start giving these things away for free to everyone. And so we started doing that in the early days. It was just John Grimm, who's a senior scientist in the lab, the co-inventor of these Genelia fluor dyes. And John would make the compounds uh, and aliquot them. And I would field all the emails and put things in bags and uh, we would send stuff out. So after a while, uh, this started taking up more and more of our time. So a couple days a week and we realized we needed help. So uh, John got help from a fantastic series of technicians over the years, uh, Natalie, is unfortunately leaving us in a, a few weeks to start graduate school. These two guys are already in graduate school. Uh, and um, we also got a lot of help from uh, the head of this tool translation team, T3 Tim Brown, administrative help from Anastasia, and then IT help from Megan Beamish, creating a, essentially an e-commerce portal so people can log in, request stuff, uh, and it keeps track of our inventory and, and basically keeps us quite organized. So uh, together uh, over the last five years, we've given away about 12,000 aliquots of our dyes to well over a thousand labs. And if you uh, think about the list price of some of these fluorophores from companies, uh, it represents about $50 million worth of stuff that we've given away uh, in the last few years. So uh, we were shut down over the pandemic. Uh, but we're back. So John just tweeted this a couple of weeks ago. He revamped our freezer containing now thousands of vials of dye and uh, we're ready to go. So if anyone wants to try things out, you just need to email me, we'll send you a link and we'll send you some stuff. All right, so I'll just end with a little bit of science. So what's interesting about these dyes in addition to being extremely bright is that some of these fluorophores are fluorogenic, meaning when they bind their cognate biomolecular target, they turn on. So here's an example. This is JF635, the halo tag ligand. This is this little fluoroalkane piece that binds the halo tag protein. And when this binds, it uh, goes from this colorless form, which predominates uh, in water as the free ligand, uh, to a highly uh, colored fluorescent form. We get about a two order of magnitude 
change in absorbance and fluorescence. And so this is useful if you just want to dump some dye in your sample, you'll only see the stuff that's bound. But Eric and I had this idea, perhaps we could uh, exploit this change in optical properties and use it uh, for sensing. So we knew that uh, this uh, change in properties was due to uh, the protein environment. And uh, we also did some careful spectroscopy and found that uh, this form on the protein is only about 70% of the material, 30% uh, is still in this uh, colorless form. And so there's an equilibrium on the surface of the protein that we might be able to exploit. So Eric helped us solve the crystal structure of the halo tag bound to a ligand. And then that allowed Eric to design rationally uh, uh, proteins with uh, sensor domains flanking the dye. Uh, and then changes in confirmation of these sensor domains could change the environment around the dye, causing an increase in fluorescence. And so Eric mentioned this uh, GCAMP sensor. So we took uh, cues from that and made something we call HaloCAMP. This is a circularly permuted halo tag with a comodulin uh, motif that uh, Eric mentioned and a, a comodulin binding peptide. When calcium binds, you get a, a change in the environment around the fluorophore and it turns on. So this works in vitro, it works in cells. These are neurons being electrically stimulated. And one cool thing about this is uh, we can all optimize these uh, sensors, not just by uh, high throughput screening mutagenesis of the protein, but we can also change the dye. And so my lab is busy uh, making new variants of this uh, JF635 with uh, interesting properties and Eric's lab is busy making different protein variants and we're screening combinations and finding um, uh, indicators with, uh, with specific properties. All right, so um, that's uh, the brief story. Uh, uh, it's been really a pleasure to work with fantastic scientists in my lab uh, other labs here at Genelia and outside. So thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Luke. That was a great talk. Um, let's get right into some questions. Um, first question is, um, you know, it's, you're doing a lot of dye production and dissemination right now. Um, and is there any thought of outsourcing the production of the Genelia floor dyes? Yeah, I mean, my, you know, my dream is to have an ad gene for chemicals. There are many challenges with that. Uh, but I think, I think uh, it would be useful because there are tools that um, would be uh, beneficial to the biological community, but don't have quite the margins or the volume to make them a viable product for a company. So I think there's a, a, a sweet spot there where, where an ad chem type thing could fill. Um, we do partner with companies. So in some cases, uh, some of our stuff can be uh, viable. So um, uh, a few companies do sell some of the Genelia floors. So when it makes sense, we do partner with uh, companies. Great. Um, so, so the next question is a little bit more programmatic. Can you tell us um, the molecular tools and imaging program at Genelia? Is this um, mainly driven by the biology going on at Genelia or is it more self-driven or is it some combination? Can you speak a little bit to that? <clears throat> yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, when, when I tell people I'm a chemist at a, at a place that does mostly biology, uh, I think the assumption is, oh, you run a shared core for chemistry. And the idea is a little bit different. Um, now, you know, we don't necessarily have to collaborate with anyone at Genelia, but uh, we're here. It would make no sense to just be here and do our own little chemistry thing. Sure. So it's, it's, it's sort of, um, uh, I guess, a bottom-up thing. We, uh, we, we're all here. Uh, we uh, are all experts in our own field, as I mentioned, um, but uh, because we're in this environment, immersed in this environment, we get access to problems that uh, other folks may not realize are, are biological problems. And so we can direct our program to address these uh, problems while still you know, spending our days and nights, uh, in my case, doing chemistry. 
Right. So somewhat related to that, I'm curious to know, um, you know, you, you have a lot of um, uh, backgrounds, uh, people from different backgrounds in molecular tools and imaging, but do you, are you seeking, are you looking for tool builders with expertise in areas that are not um, already um, filled in your group uh, with, as far as like the scope design, the fluorescent sensors, are you looking for um, additional expertise? Yeah, we're always, uh, I think uh, we're, we're always looking for uh, uh, other, people with expertise um, in other areas. Uh, for example, you know, we recently hired Abraham, who has a more material science background. It might seem odd uh, for uh, a biology institute, but uh, it works. I, I think um, you know, we would love to have uh, a diverse array of, of scientific disciplines at Genelia. Who, you know, and it, it takes a, a particular type of scientist, someone who wants to do their own thing, but uh, has an eye for biological applications, but it, it could be uh, beyond uh, our optical physics, protein engineering, chemistry uh, mm -hmm. complement that we have right now. Let's uh, move on to a question from um, Jacek Kolonowski. Jason has a Jacek has a question about the halo tag. Go ahead, Jacek. Yeah. Hello. Thanks a lot. Uh, so I just wanted to ask you if there is a reason why you uh, prepare your fluorophores. Uh, as a substrate for halo tag only. I know you show the structure of the protein and said that this matches there, but wouldn't you expect also the same fluorogenicity behaviors with other protein tags uh, if you attach uh, if you attach your fluorophores to them? Mm. Yeah, we, we we like the halo tag for a couple different reasons. Um, so the halo tag was developed by uh, scientists at Promega, and they did a really great job uh, with the directed evolution. So we like the halo tag because the labeling kinetics are quite fast. And unlike some of the other tags, there's a very tight association of the dye with the surface of the protein. And so across the board with these uh, fluorogenic molecules, we often see a higher degree of fluorogenicity with the halo tag than some of the other things like the snap tag. And, and our thought is that uh, with some of the other tagging systems, the dye is sort of flapping out in the wind and, and uh, it, it doesn't have as tight association, so uh, that change in environment is not so dramatic. So you don't get uh, these large increases in uh, absorption and fluorescence. So, so we like it for a couple different reasons. It's extremely fast, which is important in vivo, and uh, the tight association magnifies this fluorogenic effect. All right, thanks for that question, Yasek. Let's move on to a question from Eric Zhao. Eric, are you there? Would you like to ask your question? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so, so you know, quantum dots are well known for its bright, for its you know, pretty impressive brightness and and the uh, you know resistance to the photo bleaching. So, are these organic fluorescence dyes you know better than the quantum dots? No, quantum dots are way better, um, but quantum dots are way bigger. So uh, here uh, we're, uh, you know, the, the state of the art is uh, fluorescent proteins. Uh, it's a little clunkier to have to use a small molecule dye, but as Eric mentioned, we can introduce it either IV or IP, so it doesn't scare biologists too much. Going with quantum dots, uh, I think in vivo is much more challenging. They're large, you have to coat them to make them biocompatible uh, and, um, and then uh, trying to direct them to specific cells is, is difficult. So we think uh, this is a, again, a sweet spot where we get uh, modestly imp improvements in, in uh, brightness and photostability, but still uh, compatible with the in vivo experiments, which are a mainstay at Genelia. All right, thanks for that great question. I think I want to close with um, a question that came up um, sort of during Eric's talk, but can really be directed to either one of you. Um, you guys both made it um, look very easy, the development of these sensors and dyes, but we all know that's not the case. Can you just tell us a little bit about some of the challenges um, and obstacles that you faced um, sort of during the course of, of developing these sensors? 
Yeah, I think, I think, so, you know, when I, I showed that tweet from John with the freezer. So one thing we had to do is, is clean out a freezer to fill it up with a bunch of vials to send out. And I was going through basically a decade's worth of, of stuff. And one, one thing that struck me as I was throwing away a lot of aliquots is, is that about half of the aliquots were from things that we had made uh, that ultimately really didn't work. So, you know, in all of these uh, presentations, you always show the stuff that works, but there's a lot of trial and error. And, um, you know, especially with chemistry, you have an idea, you have to make the thing to test your idea. And uh, it's, it's sometimes disappointing because you spend all this time doing all the synthesis, maybe the synthesis is, is clever, and then uh, ultimately, you, you know, you try this thing out in a cell or an animal and it simply doesn't work. So, so there is a lot of, of pain uh, along the way. There's a lot of failed ideas uh, to get to the ones that work. Yeah, I can imagine that's the case. I don't know if um, Eric might have a comment on that also. Eric, did you, you know, are there any sort of uh, obstacles or challenges that you want to share with us, you know, quickly in the last minute or so? Um, sure, I, I would say, can you hear me okay? Am yeah, I still? we can. Okay, great. Um, I would say, similar to what Luke said, most of what we make doesn't work, right? <laughs> um, we don't have, actually, we do have freezers full of things that, that didn't work. Um, they're not in the form of, of aliquots of chemicals, but they're in the form of um, glycerol stocks of E. coli expressing different uh, different sensors that that weren't useful. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, we, do, we end up sort of combining strategies of, of rational design and screening um, to most efficiently get at things that hopefully are useful. Um, but yeah, the vast majority of, of tweaks that we make or, you know, new types of things we make by combining different protein domains um, end up breaking the function of one or both of those protein domains and sure. are essentially useless. Um, so yeah, um, the, the main challenge is a lot of trial and error and there's no guarantee that even if you have a solid idea for a thing that would be useful conceptually, uh, that you'll actually be able to make it or that something exists out there in nature that's close enough to, um, to give you a starting point. Got it. All right, I think that's all we have time for today. I just want to close by once again thanking our speakers, Eric Schreiter and Luke Labus. Um, we really enjoyed your talks today. Um, um, those of you who still have questions that you would like to have answered, um, Eric and Luke have promised me that they will head over to Slack um, after the seminar so you can um, ask all the questions you like over there. And I put a link to Slack in the chat box. Um, I also once again, I want to thank our audience for joining us today. Um, and I also want to call out next week's seminar. Um, uh, we will be hearing from Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory um, next Wednesday. Um, and the speakers will be Zachary Lipman and Rebecca Leishan. So please join us next Wednesday, 9 a.m. Eastern at the same link. And we look forward to seeing you then. Thanks, everyone.